Uh, hopefully you all had nice breakfast and things. Excellent. So I'm John Garbutt. I'm a principal engineer at Stack HPC, and I'm here with Matt Pryor, who also works with me at Stack HPC. And today we're going to talk to you about self-servicing Loki applications um, for non-technical users. And you'll have heard, of, hopefully, in the keynote, you've heard a little bit about that. We're going to go into a bit more detail on the azimuth side of things. So just a quick uh, introduction to Stack HPC and who we are. Uh, we're formed in 2016 and based in Bristol, although ironically neither of us are in Bristol. Uh, we're the other peoples <laughs> in the UK. So I'm over in Cambridge. And uh, we've, got, we've got colleagues in France and Poland. And really we've been looking at how, how to bring scientific computing um, and cloud and HPC and bring all these things together and, and make things work. And the way that we work at Stack HPC is always open. We're a big supporter of the four opens and doing most of our work is Apache licensed uh, and a lot of it within the OpenStack community and uh, related communities. So what do we really do? Um, this isn't just an excuse to have a picture of Lego, that's cool. Um, so we work with our customers really to look at the kind of infrastructure they need, help them pick the right components, and how do we put all these things together to sort of get the most from your investment, you know, investment in the hardware, the infrastructure, the people, how do we get the best out of all of that? Um, so you've seen these three pictures before probably, <laughs> slightly different take on them. I think it's an interesting way of looking what um, we do with um, Loki at Stack HPC. So you know, the Linux, OpenStack, and Kubernetes infrastructure. So the first part of that is a reconfigurable kind of conference room. Um, so if you plan ahead, you can build a system where it can be one big <coughs> supercomputer, or it can be lots of little pieces doing completely different things for different people. But you can't do that if you don't plan ahead. Like if you don't actually, when you build the thing, you don't build it that way. So there's a lot of work to try and make that sort of dynamic infrastructure and make the most of the reconfigurable infrastructure that we get from Loki. In addition, this is also done with isolation. Um, I particularly like this picture um, because those of you who've been to P2Gs or you know, other conferences and this kind of thing, you sort of, I think it's a good analogy for the noisy neighbor problem, like when people are having an argument or design discussion in the other room. So you've got to be careful about how you get that isolation working. So I said HPC and high performance. Um, to get the most out of the infrastructure and your, the most value out of what you're doing, often we need to really try and optimize the performance. Uh, I've taken a picture of the red arrows here um, just to show sort of, you know, that it's like a display team. So you have to have all the things working together to get the really good performance to get rid of that. Bugger off at App Store. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, it's the great thing if your laptop's still in UK time. It really the updates in the middle of the day here. Um, anyway, so yeah, high performance is the most value. Now, all of this isn't very useful if people can't actually use the thing. How do we sort of cookie cutter out these optimized stacks, how do we make it easy for people to just walk up and you know, use what's required? And that's where Azimuth comes in to help give you a catalog of these things that you can pick and deploy. And you do that in a way that uses all the optimizations for that local infrastructure. So you can get all of that good practice and make that available to people. So we've been doing this for a while. Stack HPC, creating reference platforms with people, uh, creating Slurm clusters, and creating all these things. But um, in the last year or so, last couple of years, um, getting to the point where there's a level of maturity that you can actually self-service these things, press the button, and expect it to actually work every time. So we haven't gone on this journey alone. I said we work. Um, open first at Stack HPC, that's definitely true. And, as, and part of that it really helps work in co-development with our customers. So um, Azimuth started at Jasmine and also in very much ways it started with Matt. So I'm gonna hand over to Matt who's gonna take you through some of the sort of history of Azimuth and then go into the details. Cool, thank you John. So yeah, I. Uh I was the original developer of the Jasmine Cloud Portal, which was the pre-runner, the forebear to Azimuth now. Um, so 
I moved from Jasmine to Stack HPC a couple of years ago, um, and we've carried on developing with all these people and others as well. So, uh, but really, we wanted to talk about why why we're doing this. I mean, um, you know, there's a legacy way of deploying applications. People users used to put apps on their laptops, or and you know. Um, the more things you put on your laptop, the more likely you are to get in your dependency hell problem, and it becomes a massive support support burden on your IT department. Or um, and then you know you get in, especially with research workloads, which is what we primarily work with. Um, some of these require specialist hardware like GPUs or network accelerators. Um, and then you know what happens if your application needs a Kubernetes cluster, or if you want a Slurm cluster, or um, all of these things are really complicated beasts to deploy. And if you leave it up to users to deploy these things, they'll probably get something wrong, and you'll get a support request. And so we kind of, like John alluded to, we've got uh, OpenStack potentially gives us a better way. So it gives us this this shared configurable hardware pool, and it gives us APIs that we can use to manipulate that. Um, and then we can build our apl application stacks on top of that, and ac spanning across all of this is the cloud native automation tooling, so DevOps tool, the DevOps toolkit in this slide. But there's a load of options here. So it's sort of how do you, uh, how do you tame this complexity? So this bit's OpenStack, roughly speaking. Um, there's obviously more components than that. Um, but this is the space that Azimuth is trying to fill. So we're trying to do Kubernetes and Slurm, and then, but with a focus on the applications on top of that. So, so like I said, Azim with, with Azimuth, we're trying to tame this complexity and make sure all the abstractions are in place so that people can do the things that they are good at. So that means users self-service the applications that they need but they don't need to know how to install those applications necessarily. They just need to dis deploy the thing and then get on with their job. And the platform engineers who understand good DevOps practices get to maintain a catalog of optimized applications that include, like John said again, optimizations for their site. Um, and then again, this lets us share the good DevOps practices. And all this is enabled by the Loki APIs and the cloud native automation tools that we've all sort of grown to love. Uh, and the benefits of this is that your users become more productive and your support burden on your IT department is reduced. Um, and so we end up extracting the most value from the hardware and from the people. So, so what does this look like in, in Azimuth? So this is the Azimuth user interface. This is the, uh, the deployment at Jasmine. Um, so this is, where you, this is where you come in. So you sign in with your OpenStack credentials, and you come, and we support the federated flow as well. And this is the page that you come to. And you pick a platform from a catalog. You configure that platform. So I picked a Linux workstation. So I just pick the size. I pick the amount of storage that I want to attach to it. And then it goes away, it provisions it, becomes, eventually it becomes ready. Uh, there's a, each platform gets a sort of a details dialogue, and this text is all um, populated by the appliance itself. And then these services uh, become available for the user to, to click on, and then they take you through to your web console. And you'll notice up here we have uh, I don't know if the laser pointer works. Up here, we have a sort of random domain. And this is how we're exposing applications to users. So we have an application proxy that's uh, tunneling. So we don't consume any floating IPs to do any of this stuff. So the, the applications will punch out, um, and then they get assigned one of these domains, and the traffic goes back down to the application that way. So. And that's what this Zenith application proxy does. So here's the happy user. Uh, we take advantage of uh, Ingress in Kubernetes to do this. So Ingress, Ingress gives us a really simple way to get a reconfigurable HTTP proxy, basically, dynamically reconfigurable. 
And then this Zenith server is basically a heavily customized SSHD server. The Zenith client is a heavily customized SSH client. And then there's a proxied application underneath. And this is just a bit of glue code around some industry standard software. So open SSH, Kubernetes, Nginx, console. Um, and the nice thing about doing this is it lets us do uh, let's us run our applications on, in private networks behind a firewall and or, and or a NAT. Um, the clients, have, there's a way of pre-establishing trust for the clients. So you, not every, not any, like you have to be pre-authenticated before you can start a client connection. Um, uh, but at this, at the top here in the ingress controller, we can enforce SSO and TLS. So that's what we do. Um, uh, there's two kinds of there's two kinds of applications you can make available through this catalog. At Stack HPC, we provide some reference applications, which you saw in that catalog slide. But um, anything that's expressible in one of these two ways I'm about to show you can be made available as an appliance in Azimuth. So the first stack we have, and this is how we do the Linux workstation and Slurm, is a Packer Terraform and Ansible stack. So this can do single machine or clustered applications. Uh, we punch out the infrastructure with Terraform and then we adopt those machines into an Ansible inventory and we configure them with Ansible. Um, if you want to speed up the provisioning, which we do with our Azimuth appliances, you can pre-build images using Packer with all the dependencies on. So we do that for, for Slurm, for instance. Uh, and then the web, any web applications that you want to run, so like monitoring, like access to Grafana or open on demand for Slurm or the Guacamole web interface that we just saw, those are exposed using this Zenith application proxy. And the form that you present to the user is customized using some metadata that lives with your appliance code. And we've got a little sample appliance here. Each appliance lives in its own Git repository with its own version control. Um, and you can do, um, and you just tell Azimuth where that Git repository is, which version you want to use, and it will pick it up. The second kind of, the second version of apps that we support is apps that deploy on top of Kubernetes. So firstly, we support deploying Kubernetes. Uh, and to, to do that, we use cluster API. Um, I don't know if anyone was in the Magnum talk yesterday, but I spoke, we spoke about cluster API at length then. It's basically Kubernetes deploying, using Kubernetes to deploy more Kubernetes clusters. Um, and it works really nicely. And then on top of that, we deploy applications using Helm charts. So any application you can express in a Helm chart, you can deploy using Azimuth. And again, we have a way to expose web applications from inside the Kubernetes cluster. They only need to have a cluster IP and we can expose them out using Zenith. And we generate, in this case, we generate the forms from the Helm values schema that goes with the Helm chart. So. And the, the, the final bit of sort of magic source that we have is that we can actually grant access to these platforms to people who are not OpenStack users. So the pattern we're, we're seeing in our research, uh, in, in the UK research uh, domain is there's a big push on these things called research software engineers who are supposed to be sort of more technical people that work with the scientists. And so the kind of one of the patterns we're seeing is that the research software engineers might have access to Azimuth and then and deploy platforms for their group. And then they might grant access to members from their group to um, to the, to the individual platforms as they need it. And an, another thing we're seeing is things like people who want to run a workshop on Jupyter Notebooks, for example. The person who's running the workshop might deploy the Jupyter Notebook and then grant access to workshop participants without them having to have an OpenStack account. And the way that works is we've um, integrated with Keycloak. So uh, you, there's an identity provider page in the Azimuth UI that you click and it takes you through to your Keycloak realm. Each project gets a Keycloak realm and the people who can access Adam Azimuth are realm admins within that Keycloak realm. So they can do things like create new users or add new federations. Um, so there's a new user, jblogs. There's a link within the Azimuth interface. There's a, a button to copy the URL and then you can send that to your users not moving on. 
Um, and when they come to when they go to that URL, they they get redirected to the Keycloak sign-in page. Um, to start with, they get forbidden because they need to be added to the correct group. So this is the group. Um, you, you add the user to the group, and then they can get into there. They can get into the web interface of whatever the platform is that you've given them access to. And so we just wanted to run through a few of the ways that our customers are using this. So Jasmine is the the first customer, in a way. Um, they operate a, a, a community OpenStack cloud, which is primarily used for Earth Sciences, and they're using our standard appliances at the moment. So one of their heaviest use cases is Dask Hub. So they, they're a, a Python shop, and Dask is a framework that allows you to distribute Python applications really, uh, Python calculations really easily. Uh, so one of their typical use cases, like I said, is running training courses using Jupyter Notebooks. And this is only, these guys, and Jasmine funded the development of this application, this external application user capability, so just so they could do this kind of stuff, basically. And the second customer um, I wanted to talk about is uh, CFMS. So this is the center for, um, they do, basically they do modeling and simulation, like CFD types things and, um, Center for Modeling and Simulation, I think it is. And um, they have an OpenStack private cloud that they use to provide compute services to their clients um, where they can self-service modeling and simulation applications. These are often Windows-based. And so CFMS actually worked with us to develop uh, a Windows workstation appliance. I think they now, they've carried on using Azimuth since we were working with them. And they've actually also developed a, like a, an Active Directory domain appliance that deploys an, a, an Active Directory and a bunch of workstations all connected together. It's quite, yeah, it works really nicely for them. Uh, so this was a Terraform and Ansible appliance uh, which uses Windows images with RDP enabled. And then to do guacamole, because it doesn't run on Windows, we have a tiny little Linux sidecar that gets deployed as part of the same application. To the user, it all looks like one application. Uh, and then guacamole is exposed using Zenith. Um, so I'm going to hand back over to John to talk about uh, our work with GraphCore. So. Thanks, Matt. So I'm not going to go through in too much detail what we're doing with GraphCore, because actually uh, the next session in the room just over there is all about what GraphCore have been doing, um, going into the details of how they're using OpenStack and how they're using Azimuth. And you saw some of this in the keynote. Um, but I think let's also talk about it, their core use case is really development environments. So how do you quickly spin up a development environment and so people can get going um, and get working with, in their case, specialist hardware? So this actually is a use case that came up an awful lot in terms of e-infrastructure in the UK for the science research. And one of the phrases that kept coming up is, how can I get a bigger laptop? Like my laptop keeps running out of memory and getting hot and I need a real GPU. Like how can I just get one for a little bit to test my code on the bigger system? And there's a big barrier to entry if people just go up to Horizon and go, you're asking me all sorts of questions I have no idea about right now. Um, so this is where Azimuth came in. So one of the things that we did um, to adapt Azimuth for this kind of development use case is that guacamole access. So one of the things to highlight about that is that if you start asking some users to give me an SSH key, um, very often, right, they'll, put, they'll, they'll give you the private, well, they'll send the private key to you in an email and keep the public one and all that kind of thing. And this, like, if you're not sure what on earth's going on, it's a perfectly reasonable mistake. Um, so it's kind of, like, how do we get that secure? And that's where Azimuth comes in. Like, there's no SSH keys. We don't, we're not bounded by the amount of, um, public IP addresses that are available for this thing, because you know you go to the floating IP and someone else has nicked it, like no one left. Um, so that's why we've got. That's why Zenith came about, is to have that ability to just have lots of little development platforms, uh, and getting that infrastructure ready and getting to it, and not just getting stuck at the first hurdle of you're asking me very very difficult questions and I have no idea what you're talking about. So that's where that came from, and that was a, a long process of sort of giving users access to a thing and saying, does this help? And they're like, yeah, it's great, but I need a volume. I need some more storage than you're giving me in this flavor. So if you saw that dialog box asking for the, the volume, that's where that came from. 
There's another version of that where you actually do get a floating IP in SSH, because for some reason people want to rsync their data everywhere. Um, so they needed a public IP, but not forever all the time. And so that's the kind of journey we've been going on. So I alluded to this problem with fixed capacity clouds. Um, so when you log into Azimuth, we've made a rash assumption that there's resources available for you to go and create something. That's not always true. Um, actually, maybe just a quick survey. Are there people running sort of private clouds that you could call a fixed capacity cloud in the room? Okay, a good few people. Um, so you've probably always, you've had someone squatting on your GPUs, right? <laughs> they got hold of the GPU and they're like, success! It's mine! And quotas are really good at making sure you can only get one of them. I'm saying that flippantly, of course, because current quotas don't do that very well. But unified limits in yoga do. Slight advert. Um, but yeah, that's a quota is a very uh, public cloud concept. When I was at Rackspace Public Cloud, the quota was roughly equating to, well, if the credit card bounces, like how bad is it? <laughs> and generally, the way that you got your quota up is you prepaid some credit, because we're like, well, got that much. <laughs> so, and that's not the case with you know, fixed capacity clouds, right? So what's the alternative? Um, the alternative is another pretty picture. Um, <laughs> So we tried to, I tried to think of an analogy of what this would be like in a nice world. So what's this sort of coral reef cloud where everyone's living together nicely? Um, and I suppose being from the UK and a bit British, you know, how do you ask permission to sort of have it tomorrow and that kind of thing? So we've been working with the Blazor project. So Blazor allows you to go up and ask, you know, tomorrow, could I have two GPUs, please? Um, and it very politely says, no, they're all gone tomorrow too and then you can ask for some more. So one of the active things we're developing on right now is that when you go to your platform, you, you request, I want a big Jupyter Hub or I want a bigger laptop with you know, 10 terabytes of memory, please, because I'm doing astronomy and it's a really big image, or whatever it is, you pick the platform, you pick the size, then you get another dialog box that where you pick where and when. Like, you know, when is that possible? so you can actually schedule your appliances. The first small step of this that we have done, as you probably noticed, noted in the keynote, um, that we put like a minimum lifetime on the appliances. So that's like the first sort of step towards limiting VM sprawl. It's like, well, you've got it, but you've only got it for 24 hours. So, you know, um, that's good. Naturally, people moan that they have to now, every 48 hours or 24 hours, come back and get another one. But then you get that sort of natural balancing. But if we can do... We can do something better where we have like a concept of credits, so like CPU hours, give people credits, and they can, when they book a reservation, they can't book a reservation more than their credits. Um, we can take this a step further. One of the downsides of doing reservations is that there's space in your system where it's not being used, right, in between the reservations, the gaps. Um, so that's where um, Blazar is looking at preemptible instances. So if you've got like a Dask system that can deal with workers coming and going a bit, you can sort of auto-scale your Kubernetes into some of those holes, you know, limited by your quota. Another piece is looking at changing Blazor so that when you request a uh, ugh, reservation, when you request a reservation, you use a existing flavor to say, I want a green, a green one, a blue one, please, rather than I want four CPUs and this amount of RAM and then cause massive fragmentation. So there's a bit of a pivot there. Okay. Um, conscious of the time. So just going through a few of the other plans, um, I guess one of the calls to action here is if this is a kind of use case that's interesting, interesting to you, do get in touch. All of this is open source. Uh, and by open source, I really do mean like trying to follow the four OpenStack opens. Um, and it'd be great to get more people involved in this. So one of the big pieces of work we're doing at the moment is we have people running this in production now. So there's a lot of operational enhancements and getting on that nice loop of, well, we need that extra notification um, so we can spot when that thing goes wrong and have you know the run books and things that people use to operate this system at you know, reasonable scale. As I said, we've done the preview of the, the maximum application lifetime. 
Uh, and there's lots of other bits of work in progress. So things like making sure that the environments in those bigger laptops are more batteries included, to use the Python kind of terminology. So looking, we've added ESSI in there uh, to, that can help get LMOD modules, although actually that's only in the Slurm right now. But trying to you know, have Aptana and Podman and these kind of things available. We've done optimizations to make sure that you can have GPU workloads and Kubeflow and OFED using a lot of the operators in, in, in uh, Kubernetes. We've just been through a lot of the reservation pieces. Uh, and generally, one of the other things is that there's this um, onboarding life cycle of uh, people wanting to create science platforms or applications and run them on your system. So what we're looking at here is that people can come into Azimuth, create some platforms and go, well, that's almost what I need, and making the flow from getting the almost what I need to being able to use all of those optimizations that you've got on your site, tweaking that, and potentially even running that outside of Azimuth doing things like Argo CD. So that you've got, so we can basically have a set of recipes that says, if you've got OpenStack and you want to kind of run these systems on there, this is a nice way in which you can start, um, start from the ground running, you know, get, get a leg up there on how, how to do that. So it's a good way of sharing good practice. It might not be the way that you end up doing it, but there's an awful lot of um, reinventing the same thing that this is trying to help uh, eliminate. The reverse of that is, if you discover a really cool way of doing it, you can contribute that back too. That's awesome. <laughs> so I'm conscious um, we're 26 minutes past, and we should probably um, go on to a few questions, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the call to action here is do definitely, you know, get in touch um, if you've got questions or you know just you want to try it out. If you want to try it out, there's that URL there. Um, Architecturally speaking, Azimuth is very like the OpenStack CLI in that you give it your OpenStack credentials and it makes OpenStack API calls. So you and your project can actually use Azimuth on any OpenStack cloud you've got, give it a whirl. It does like a little all-in-one setup. Um, it tries to guess really hard based on the access you've got to OpenStack and the kind of things you want to set up. But um, the documentation gives you some hints on uh, telling it what's actually true. So that's definitely worth a go if you're interested in this thing. Um, there's a whole bunch of GitHub things. Um, it, one thing that is interesting, I guess, here is that we're using um, Helm charts to stamp out the Kubernetes resources. So there is actually um, several people have taken the Helm charts as this is a recipe to stamp out Kubernetes using cluster API and OpenStack. So rather than having to know all the resources, you just give it the set of Helm values and press go. And the interesting thing there and you should totally listen to Matt, the recording of Matt's talk, um, Matt Mohammed's talk yesterday. Um, there's a lot of add-ons that you need inside that are on top of just vanilla cluster API. Things like the GPU operator and that kind of thing. And, this, and a way to get RDMA inside the pods. So we've actually got RDMA working inside those Kubernetes pods as well. That's a whole different talk. <laughs> Let's not go there. But um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening. If there's any questions, do come to the mic. Yeah, do you want to use the mic just because um, the nice people listening to this afterwards? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> uh, I guess one, whenever I've worked with research computing engineers, I always see uh, like cloud bursting as being kind of a big uh, ask. Have you, uh, do you get a lot of like, do you, I guess that solution is probably more at the application layer than the infrastructure layer, but do you have to, are you getting a lot of like requests for that? So on the first introduction to Stack HPC slide, I skipped over the bullet point that said we're working on hybrid solutions. So it's almost like I planted you to ask that question because I forgot to mention it. Um, <laughs> so yes. Um, in one level, what we're doing in Azimuth is cloud bursting because for a lot of these people, they're using the common infrastructure that's offered to them, not necessarily the home standard thing. For a lot of these people, their home standard thing is a laptop, right? So this is the cloud bursting. Um, that's definitely cheating, <laughs> right? Um, but the idea here is that um, when I talked about you pick the size of your platform and then you pick where or when, um, 
I didn't go into the where. I was talking about the when with the reservations. But I think the where is that there may be multiple regions here, and one of them might have a Blazor reservation, not the other. If you're doing simulation, then you have to move data, and that would be easier, right? Um, and there's also a, a where it might be some other non-open stack cloud, for example. So actually, a lot, if you look at the technologies we've picked here, we've picked cluster API because it's fairly cloud agnostic. I say fairly, right, because everyone's got their own st stuff, but you're talking the same kind of thing. It's very similar Kube to Terraform. The Kubernetes looks the same as well. That's the most yeah. important thing, because whatever infrastructure you deploy on with cluster API, it's Kube ADM that's managing it, and it looks the same. And all the same add-ons will work. Yeah, and like John was about to say, Terraform is similar in that sense. Yeah. So we've deliberately made infrastructure, we've deliberately made choices with our automation tooling to make multi-cloud easier in the future, and we are gonna be doing that soon, probably. So yeah, so absolutely. It's on our roadmap. Are there any more questions? That was a good one. Well, actually, we're out of time, I guess. So, good. Excellent, thank you very much, everybody.